Hey, Duncan, come here. Good boy. Good boy. Good to see you. Yes, I'm home now. Oh, yeah, you want to play. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, travel's a lot of fun. You make so many great memories, but it's also good to get home and see friends like Duncan. You see, I've had the great fortune to be able to visit some wonderful locations over my years doing the show. I met some interesting people, tried new and different foods, seen some beautiful sights, and learned a thing or two along the way. So today, we're gonna to take a look back at some of my favorite travel segments. And we're gonna start at Monticello. Good boy. While visiting the home of Thomas Jefferson, I had a chance to learn about some of the historic plants on the property. Peggy Cornett, Monticello's curator of plants, shared Jefferson's fascinating vision that defined our horticultural heritage. It's so good to see you again. Well, welcome to Virginia. It's great to have you here. Well, it's just beautiful, and what a beautiful day. You know, I, what I think is so interesting and wonderful about the Thomas Jefferson Center for Historic Plants is that it gives everybody an opportunity to actually have something growing in their garden that, that Thomas Jefferson had growing in his. Exactly. I mean, that, the whole impetus for beginning the uh, Center for Historic Plants was to uh, make actual plants available to people, not just the seeds that we packaged for years and so uh, we have a nursery where we're, where we're, we're actually standing and uh, we grow plants and have plants on display here. Of course there's a lot of documentation on exactly what Jefferson grew at Monticello isn't there? That's right he kept a garden diary he wrote hundreds of letters about his gardens um, he also kept a list of what what was planted in the garden and uh, some of the things we have here are quite unique to the site um, for example, there is a blackberry lilies that were naturalized at Monticello for uh, decades and they could go actually go back to Jefferson's time period. And so we've collected seed from that and the ones that we offer to the public are actually propagated from uh, some of the original plants that once stood here on the mountain. Peggy, here in late summer, there's so much in bloom. I'm just knocked out by the, some of the vines. The cypress vine is just gorgeous. Yeah, that's a great uh, summer annual. And, you know, in a single season, it'll just climb up over your house if you let it. And uh, it's it's just a wonderful plant, a very attractive plant for hummingbirds. And well, yeah, and speaking of hummingbirds, I mean, I noticed how the hummingbirds were loving the salvia coccinea. Oh, yeah, that's a real knockout flower. and. Uh, Again, another native plant that atta attracts uh, uh, wildlife, birds, hummingbirds certainly, and bees, and and um, it's just beautiful in the gardens this time of year. You know, what's so wonderful about the Center for Historic Plants is that you're getting these uh, rare, often endangered plants into the hands of other people so they're shared and, and, and likely not to become extinct. That's exactly right. Our, our mission is to get as much out there as we can to, uh, to get people excited about historic plants, uh, To propagate them and cultivate them and, and preserve them in their own gardens, but it's also helping us. Um, it helps keep these, this living collection alive. Well, I'm particularly proud of what you're doing with old roses here in this mm -hmm. beautiful example of a old rose garden. It just, yeah, I've just become really inspired to even plant more. Well, I'm so glad to, to hear that because uh, uh, the whole impetus of this garden is to tell the, the story about um, uh, rose uh, growing in, in America in, in, uh, in Jefferson's time on into uh, into the present, really. Um, and uh, Jefferson grew many of these roses that uh, you see here in this garden. And uh, they certainly are important um, from our standpoint because um, they, they really tell an American story of uh, rose breeding uh, that began in Charleston, South Carolina. It's a, it's a great story that uh, has lots of intrigue and fascination. Well, this is very inspiring, Peggy. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for coming. Well, Duncan, good boy. When you can travel and see wonderful gardens, it's really inspiring, particularly for me, for someone who loves design so much. I bet you're the same way. Well, several years ago, I mean several years ago, 
we had the opportunity to go see my friend George Hagervorst in Holland and see his magical garden. Come on, let's take a look. One of the best ways to learn about garden design is to visit and see the works of others. When I travel, I particularly like to see the personal gardens of garden designers and to see how they've applied the 12 principles of design in their own work. In Holland, I had an opportunity to visit with George and Marion Hagerwurst. Marion is a well-respected garden designer, and George, her husband, has worked in the bulb industry for years. Marion is a little shy and modest about her work, but George is happy to show it off. George, how long have you had a garden here? We live here for 24 years, and uh, we started it. Uh, when you build this house, we started the garden as well. We had to because the, this field was used, uh, it was used for the house, so we had to do something with the ground surrounding the house. So it was just a flat plain, a yes. blank slate. So George, how did you all come up with the design of this garden? Marianne is the designer of the, gar of the garden, but we had to start with edges around to, to take the wind from the garden. It must be very difficult gardening here because of your proximity to the sea. Yeah, we live about a mile from the North Sea, and uh, yeah, all the winds come over the sea and take the salt air with it, and uh, it's very, very difficult. But I see. Now, Marion, she she's a trained garden designer. Yes, yes, she had education uh, when we came to live here. She started education for four years, and uh, during that period, she started already with the garden, and we changed that later on because you, when you start, well, you're always changing. <laughs> yes, yeah, and you do a lot of things wrong. It's really beautiful, George, and I particularly like this color scheme that you all have used here in this this space. Thank you, Marian. In all in the last autumn, she replanted all the all the plants, and and uh, we put some more hedges of uh, Santolina. Oh, it's really nice. It, the gray really pops and stands out. Yes, I like it very much, and it smells so good. Yeah, uh, the Santolina. Well, it's really its own little garden room. Yes, it is. Yes. George, I like the four trees that you've used to, to anchor the center of this garden, and it, it doesn't look like they cause much of a problem with uh, shade. No, we, we cut them all, uh, of course, to, to keep them in uh, shape, but, uh, and give a little height to, uh, to these borders. Yes, well, the, you've used trees very effectively all through this garden, with hedges and with pleached stretches of trees. Yes, and also in the front of the garden, because we, uh, we live to a quite busy road, and it gives a lot of private uh, feeling when, when the side is yes. blocked. In. Yeah, the garden does feel very private all the way around. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's nice. I think one of the, the nicest aspects of this garden that helps also create interest is the garden ornament that is placed around. I mean, some things are, are very ordinary, like stacked clay pots and, and this uh, growing collection of watering cans that you and Marion have. Yeah, it will stop growing now because we decided to, to buy no more water cans. <laughs> too many. <laughs> because we have about 100 in the garden and it's getting too many. But we, we like to, to visit markets in, uh, or whatever. England, Belgium, north of France, and yeah, walk around and see what we like to put in our garden. We're always looking for things in our garden. Wow, look at you guys. You've really grown since I've been away. Well, have you ever been to a garden that was so stunning that it was like something out of a fairy tale? Well, a few years ago, I went to Oregon and I visited my friend Raymond Fordyce at Fordyce Farms. Let me tell you, this guy grows bulbs like you cannot believe in that rich Oregon soil. Just look at the size of these glads. Have you ever seen anything so spectacular and what gorgeous color? Well, I'm in an absolutely charming garden in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. This garden is fraught with beauty. Lots of perennials, but more than that, so many summer bulbs, you just cannot believe it. Lilies, dahlias, gladioli, and these spectacular crocosmias from South Africa. Well, I had the good fortune to walk around this garden and learn more about it from its creator, Ray Fordyce. Ray, this is such a beautiful garden. What was your inspiration? 
thank you. Uh, in fact, when I was in college, I would walk past a beautiful garden every day that had been designed by a couple of landscape architect ladies in the 1930s, and they designed several significant gardens in the area. Were they laden with summer flowering bulbs like this one is? <laughs> no, like most Oregon gardens, it was a spring garden primarily. I see. A lot of things bloom here in the spring, and it's very easy to have an excellent garden. But the weather is pretty terrible here in the springtime, and it's beautiful all summer long. Well, you have certainly ushered bloom into the full summer here. Right. Yeah, right. the bulbs. I mean, I look around, I see those gorgeous crocosmias and lilies and dahlias all in flower. Yes, the purpose is something that can give you color in your garden with very little effort. And most of these bulbs are just about indestructible. They continue to multiply and produce more flower every year. I mean, it's, it's just a matter of getting them in the ground and giving them, you know, for the most part, full sun, depending yes. on what you choose. I mean, certainly what you have here is a full sun garden. And just fertilize them and take care of them in a general sort of way, and they're really easy. Yes, they're easy to live with. In fact, in this garden, I do have very rich soil, and so most of what I have grows to enormous height, which I really hadn't planned. <laughs> Nonetheless, it makes it pretty impressive. Well, I'm sure you're asked this a lot because I am. What's your favorite flowering bulb this time of year? Ah, uh, of course, these, the, the hybrid Asiatic lilies. It has a blackberry colored center with a cream edge. Mm. Well, even, even its architectural form without yes. the blooms being fully colored and open mm -hmm. is really quite handsome. Yes. Most of the lilies, in fact, that people are planting like Stargazer and Casablanca, these are cut flowers, whereas what I've looked for is long bloom season. So among dahlias, do you have a favorite? I mean, like, like the really you know, dark ones, or maybe it's the cactus flowered ones. What I'm looking for in the dahlias, there are a lot of different dahlia growers in this area. In fact, I think America's largest dahlia grower is just a few miles up the road. So you can buy a lot of dahlias anywhere. What I'm looking for in dahlias is something that's going to look good in a mixed setting. Typically, when people I find have dahlias, they'll grow one of each mm -hmm. in a row. Right. So actually, dahlias that have less showy blossoms, where there's a lot of green foliage, good structure, and works well in a mixed garden setting. Really more of a landscape dahlia, if you will, yes. than one that's than for show, show or cutting. Right. I am so taken away with what I found out here in what seems like the, the middle of Oregon, among all these beautiful fields of grain, this, this gem. Have you ever come across something totally by surprise, like a fair in the middle of nowhere? Well, this friend of mine who is crazy about goats has some amazing goats in the middle of, guess where, Chicago. Yes, Carolyn Yoder is a goat enthusiast and she's eager to share her enthusiasm with you. What do you think there, kiddo? take a look at some little goats in the big city. crosses. Uh, they're three years old. This is their second uh, brood of babies. They both had two sets of twins this year. When we started this, our objective was, was it remains three things, which is to inspire, to educate, and to relate to the neighborhood. So we basically would like to inspire kids to think about doing something else and uh, educate people on another way of living, especially at good food. Where does your food come from? Where do eggs come from? We don't sell eggs here. We do a lot of giving away of eggs to neighbors so that they can figure out where the eggs come from. They get to go to the box, and the kids get to pull out an egg, and it's all very exciting. And then the last thing is to relate to our neighbors. Some neighbors aren't too crazy about the goats, uh, but we work really hard to keep them out of trouble. Because uh, goats, when they get out of a fencing, they can be kind of trouble. But in general, um, they're uh, interesting and gentle and playful creatures. 
And as one child said to me, she had never seen baby chicks before. When we had the chicks this spring, she looked in at to the pen where they were and she said to me, they're so peaceful. And the city doesn't have much peace. And uh, it's, it's a very beautiful place that way when the kids can come in and they can see something else other than what they see on the streets. Seems like no matter where I travel, I always find myself in a garden somewhere, which is okay by me. Just look at this gorgeous amaryllis. Well, anyway, one of the gardens that I really enjoy, which isn't very far from my home at Moss Mountain, is the Memphis Botanic Garden. David, I'm just crazy about how interactive the children's garden is. Oh, Everywhere you turn. It's so fun. And this is actually Playhouse Lane. So you have five different playhouses here created by five different artists, actually, local artists. This is a xylophone bench. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Who would have known? Absolutely. Just I think the kids love it. They absolutely love it. They come in here and they just book it for this area. It's just <laughs> so much fun. There's so many different things for them to get involved in. Playhouse Lane. So what do we have here, David? So this is the country house, actually, uh, representing a little house out in the country. We have a chicken coop out back, a little. Oh, uh, right. One. And uh, inside the house, actually, we have a bunch of little toys that they can play, play house. Oh, so like little yeah. ketchup bottles How and stuff fun. like that. And then look at this. What is this? So this it looks is, like a giant mushroom. Yeah, so this is actually an old shade tree. Oh, uh, look at this. Yeah. That, look at the roots. <laughs> that this we, was one that was here. It was here, absolutely. Yeah. And so instead of trying to uproot the whole thing and get it out of here, we, we were like, well, why not use it and make it into a little uh, fairy closet? <laughs> it has a door here. <laughs> Oh, so this is where the fairies hang their clothes. I yeah, say. that's of right. Of course, and so the, the main fairy house is over here. That's right, the main okay. fairy house is over here. Well, and you can you know. see like designs on the top here, really colorful. Those fairies um, are very creative. They are creative. <laughs> yeah, look at that, amazing. And this is their house. Yeah, and, and so you can see it's uh, all these twigs and uh, <laughs> other pieces of wood that- Oh um, my gosh, what fun. Yeah, and this May is... May we go in? Oh, yeah, Hello, please. anyone home? <laughs> anyone here? And you can see the the pieces of bar, uh, trunk here. Right. That, uh, it's almost like a little puzzle that they can put together. I which see. Which is so much fun. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. So you can... And we have the little tree trunk seats here and the table. Right, um, so they can play with the fairy toys. Just such... Yeah, just such a fun little spot. Um, it is. And look, it's just made of all kinds of pieces of tree trunk and... You got the wood shake ceiling on it. Yeah, you just feel you feel like you are yeah, in a it's very a fun enclosed space. Yeah, an enchanting place. Enchanting, exactly. Yeah, it's very Absolutely. good. David, this is one big birdhouse. <laughs> yeah, and it's actually situated on the base of a sequoia tree. It's just amazing. The kids just have to love it. Oh, absolutely. If you look down here, you can see the bird shape in these rocks. Oh, that is amazing. So, it's so fun. It really is. Don't you think it's so important to inspire them and get them excited early about learning? Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. You guys have done an awesome job with this. Thank you for Thank showing you. me around. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Yeah, and come back anytime. Marvels. I'll be back for sure. <laughs> All right. Now our last travel destination, our walk down memory lane, is in my home state of Arkansas. It's Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. Now of course there's beautiful art to see, but much, much more. Oh, 
at the detail on this. That is really lifelike. Well, thank you. That's very oh kind God. of you to say. Rod, every time I come to Crystal Bridges, I'm amazed by the new displays and, well, interesting things to see. Oh, there's always something new at Crystal Bridges. So we've got new sculpture inside and out, we've got new exhibitions, and we've got new exciting things on the uh, grounds. So with this house, what is it you hope that visitors will take away from the experience? Well, I think many people have seen Frank Lloyd Wright's work from afar, and this will give you a completely, literally immersive experience within the house. Too. Sure. So you'll see that quintessential American architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. It's a house that's very, it's designed very specifically to interact with nature and light, which perfectly connects with the museum's mission. When I visit Crystal Bridges, I'm always amazed at the, the wide range of people that come here. I mean, from little kids to seniors to mm -hmm. folks all over the country and even abroad. Well, one of the exciting things is it's, it's not a static experience. I mean, you can, you can make it that way if you like. If you just want to walk through the galleries and enjoy it. That's certainly pleasurable. Right. We've but got, there are a lot of things you can do. It's so true. We have a traditional gallery experience, yeah. but we've got programming that ranges from um, three years old to 103 years old. So we have salsa dancing and art making <laughs> and we have a great culinary program where we do uh, connect art and your stomach. So there's all sorts of activities. Everybody loves that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> think about the museum as a community space. We do uh, a range of lectures in the gallery in our spaces that are informal um, and they, they cover the gamut, so from architecture to art to dance, theater, film. And this spills out into the garden, so for folks who are interested in learning about landscape design or native plants or... For the animals uh, in the area, yeah. Yeah, wildlife. So recently we did a raptor experience where you learned about owls, really? eagles, the things that are around this community. Yeah. Sure. Isn't it interesting how museums have changed just over the past 20 years? It's an incredible transformation. <laughs> so we think of ourselves more than just art-centric. We, we stretch that to culture. Yeah, yeah. As you said earlier, a community uh, space, a community mm -hmm. place. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed following me along to some of my favorite travel destinations. Hope in the future you find some wonderful adventures for yourself. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. I'm here in Old Salem, North Carolina. Well, here I am in Bush Stadium. Today we're stepping back in time to Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia. Welcome to beautiful Costa Rica. Welcome to Eureka Springs, Arkansas. We're in actually Holland, Michigan. I'm in Natchez, Mississippi. I'm in Columbus, Ohio. I'm in Chicago, the Windy City. Today, we're in Eastern Oklahoma. I'm here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm in Kansas City, Missouri, here in Newport, Rhode Island. And let me tell you, it's quite the place.